It is a message that I hope will save you from the pain and the shame and the humiliation that I faced had I heard this speech when I was an undergraduate. When I was your ages, I thought the saddest day in my life was December 17th, 1964. I was 14, and that was the day that my mother suddenly died of a ruptured brain aneurysm. She was only 34. My brother's seventh birthday, my brother Jerry's seventh birthday, was the next day. And our baby brother Randy was only three years old and has no memory of his mom. But for a long time, that was the saddest day until 28 years later. At that time, I was, had lost my marriage. I had lost my university faculty position. I was living in a roach and mouse infested house with an ex-convict. And when I got home one afternoon, there was a note uh, on the table from my housemate telling me I needed to call my stepmother because there had been a death in the family. I assumed it was my dad. He had been critically ill with heart disease for several weeks in the hospital. When I called, my stepmother's oldest sister, May, answered the phone. Tommy, I'm so sorry. I found him in the woods this afternoon. It was the moment that forever defined my life. It was the moment that is the reason why I'm standing here speaking to you this evening. My brother's decomposing body was found by two dirt bikers as they raced through the woods. He had been missing for two weeks. They found his body sitting at the foot of a pine tree with a bottle, empty bottle of Jack Daniels on one side and an empty bottle of prescription narcotics on the other side. Identification was difficult officially, but his driver's license told the story of a man who had been missing for two weeks in that little Arkansas town. Later, the medical examiner confirmed the identity with, uh, with dental records and ruled the death suicide. He was 35, a year older than our mother was when she died. He left behind a wife and two little boys, ages 10 and 8. Christopher and little Randy, little Jerry, I should say. At the funeral home, Renee told me, his, his widow told me, that Jerry had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder a few years before when he was in the Army, and then discharged without ever receiving treatment. And once he was out of the Army and back in civilian life, he was too ashamed and too afraid of stigma to go see a psychiatrist. But the VA hospital did provide a drunk tank for veterans to go to dry out after a drinking binge. And it was from a drunk tank that Jerry called me one afternoon in February. I tried to get him to come up and stay with me in the house for a while in Northwest Arkansas. He was in Little Rock at the time. Oh no, I, I gotta get home to Renee and the boys, he said. Those were the last words I ever heard my brother say. I tried to speak at his funeral, but, but tears choked every word I tried to say as I tried to tell his little boys and those in attendance how kind and generous he had been after my divorce and unemployment by letting me live with him for a while. But since I couldn't speak then, I dedicate my work and my writing now to his memory. When I was an undergraduate and my hair was as black as a moonless night and my face wasn't lined like a North Carolina road map, I was an aspiring broadcaster, but a special broadcaster. 
You see, I majored in speech and drama with a minor in religion. My plan was to be in religious broadcasting. Those were the years before the scandals of sex and corruption destroyed the ministries of televangelists like Tammy Faye Baker, uh, Jim and Tammy Faye Baker, and uh, Jimmy Swaggart. And I was pastoring two little churches in the country my first two years in college. In May 1970, I was ordained to the ministry and married the following month to a preacher's daughter. I was 19. My life seemed set, except for one little problem. I was haunted by long, deep, dark depressions. I would tell myself like a little boy whistling in the dark, well, maybe, I, maybe if I prayed more, they'd go away. One day I got so bad, I walked into the bathroom of our apartment while my wife was in class, lay down on the floor in front of a gas heater and turned on the gas. Something forced me to turn off the gas and open the door. I don't know what it was. Was I afraid of death? Was I causing other people problems? I don't know. But the depression had been that bad. Well, I wasn't depressed. I was very active in the theater as an actor. One year I played Scrooge uh, in A Christmas Carol and got standing ovations after every performance. And I, it was exhilarating. I, I was convinced that maybe I should become a professional actor and uh, not a preacher. But those were challenging times for me and trying to decide what I was going to do. You see, I didn't know anything about mental illness. There were clues that I was mentally ill, the deep, dark depressions, of course. But then there was another clue. You see, the psych majors who were friends of mine would have me do a little test every semester. It was called the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, MMPI. Perhaps you've heard of it. It's been the gold standard for uh, testing of, of uh, psychopathology and uh, personality uh, structure since 1939. I was just doing a favor for them, not knowing that they were probably telling their friends, wait till you see Tom Roberts' score. Look back at it 40 years later, I thought, well, maybe they knew I was nuts. The only thing I knew about mental illness was the, uh, well, the, the funny jokes I thought of the loonies in the state hospital. And then there was my Aunt Bessie. She was uh, my dad's oldest sister. She was a little bit off, and her son, Lester, shot himself in the leg one time to keep from going to school. I learned years later that he suffered from paranoid schizophrenia, but never treated because of fear of stigma in the family that somebody was getting psychiatric help. Today, my cousin Lester is in his 80s and living in the old house his mother owned and somewhere in Missouri, eating food out of cans that people give to him. That was the extent of my knowledge of mental illness. By my junior year, I left the ministry deciding that I could not compete with the depression anymore and that maybe I should be a performer of some kind. So I decided to enroll in a, a graduate a program at the University of Kansas in radio, television, film with a major in broadcast journalism. I won a national award for and recognition for my thesis, which was a biography of the founder of CBS News, Paul White. When I got out of school, I was a co-anchorman in the television station, and then a radio news director, and then a co-anchor and reporter for another radio station. It was at that final radio station that I got fired for the first time in my life. At that final job, I was assigned to go cover Vice President Walter Mondale as he gave a luncheon speech in Kansas City. I was sitting at a table with only one other reporter, and at every table was a bottle of wine. 
Now, I had started drinking when I was in graduate school, using it as a self-medication for the depressions. Too stupid to realize that alcohol is a depressant. Well, by the end of the vice president's speech, shall we say, there was nothing left in the bottle. The other reporter had only one glass. I took the rest of it. And those were the pre-cell phone days when I had to go out to the car and use a two-way radio to send my report back to the station. It was a hot day. In fact, uh, the heat and the alcohol didn't mix well. And I was so drunk when I filed that report, the producer couldn't use it on the next newscast. That did not get me fired. But a few months later, here's what did. I went on the air one morning and I could not catch my breath. I was hyperventilating. It was as, I have, as, as if I had never been on the air before, but I had been in broadcasting for years. It, finally, I, I, I signaled to the DJ to, to go to music, just get me out of here. I was fired the next day. Fortunately, I got a, my first university faculty position within a month at a small Christian college in Arkansas. And that's where my double life began to take over in earnest. You see, at this school you had to sign a contract. One of the items you had to sign is I'm not going to drink or smoke, but I did both. The other item you had to sign is that you not, have not been divorced, and if you do get divorced, that's it. So I began an eight-year journey there trying to hide my depressions because I believed that Christians simply did not get depressed, especially Christian faculty members. But there was another part of that, that life, and I do have to tell you this is the R-rated portion of my story. You all are 18 and older, so it's going to be safe to tell you about that. It is embarrassing. And I always like to quote Robin Williams. You'll see a picture of Robin Williams and me in happier times when you go to my Facebook, my, uh, my uh, website, TomSpeaksOut.com. Robin said, the problem is that God gave man a brain and a penis, but only enough blood to run one at a time. And that was my challenge. I wasn't thinking through it. I was able to keep uh, my extramarital activities a secret from my wife for some time until she caught me once, an administrator's wife, not a good career move. And then the second time ended it. It was all over. And I was terminated, not for infidelity, but for divorce because that was grounds for termination. I, uh, before that time, I had gone into what I learned later was a major manic episode. I had taken off for Hollywood with a woman I met in a psychiatric hospital. Seemed like a good idea to me. But once in Hollywood to pursue my dream of being a professional actor, the black dog came back, howling at me to go jump off the Santa Monica Pier. I sneaked away early one morning and got on a bus and took a long, agonizing ride back to Arkansas, hoping to save my marriage and my career as a college teacher. It was all gone. It was five years before I was finally diagnosed with bipolar disorder. I lived in an unheated cabin, worked as a hospital janitor, and other odd jobs. I flipped hamburgers at one time, whatever I could do, and got to see my kids once a month. And that was my life. But five years later, I got a fairly decent job working for a knee surgeon, uh, videotaping knee surgeries. 
And Dr. James Arnold, my, my boss at the time, had the courage to tell me that I, my behavior was scaring people. And he thought that maybe I had bipolar. He took me out of an operating room early one morning, mid-surgery, took me back to the dressing room, and told me not to come back to the office until I saw a psychiatrist. On Friday morning, Good Friday, 1993, I sat in the office of Dr. Jeffrey Tate, the psychiatrist. He asked me, what's going on? I finished my answer an hour later. There's no doubt in my mind, Mr. Roberts, that you have bipolar disorder, and I'm writing a prescription for lithium you are to start taking immediately. I'm not going to hospitalize you. I want to see you back here in a week. Well, the good doctor made a mistake in not hospitalizing me because two days later, Easter Sunday, I was in another town locked up in a hospital psych ward. That's, that was brutal, but another story. But back to that good Friday, I decided to go to Borders Bookstore while I waited for the prescription to be filled and look for a book about bipolar so I could learn more about it. I spotted the book by Patty Duke, the actress. It was very famous at that time. It's called A Brilliant Madness. I'd seen the movie about her life and struggle with manic depression a couple of years earlier, and my little six-year-old daughter, whenever she came over to see me, wanted to see the videotape of it over and over. I think she saw her daddy in Patty's story, but not old enough to articulate what she was actually seeing. My long journey of recovery had begun. Sometimes the road was bumpy, and sometimes it was smooth. One bumpy time came in San Francisco, where I had moved to become a technical writer in the Silicon Valley, starting another career. And just before dawn one morning, my little uh, half-sister, Christy, called me from Arkansas. She said, Teresa's dead. As her voice was choking with tears, she overdosed last night. Teresa was my half-sister, my stepsister, actually. She had fought major depressions for years and self-medicated with prescri prescription narcotics that uh, she would get by writing the scripts for herself and as uh, she doctor shopped. And then she finally wound up in prison for five years, came out clean and sober, and was doing pretty well until the depressions came back and so did popping pills. She would cut herself with scissors and show up at the local emergency room to get patched up and send her back home in a little town in Arkansas. She never sought psychiatric care because of the stigma, the fear of being stigmatized. It's crazy if you went to see a psychiatrist for the life of me. I can't understand why it was okay for Teresa for everybody to know she was an ex-con, and everybody to know she was a lesbian, but nobody to know that she had a mental illness. <coughs> now who's crazier? Is it the mentally ill, or is it a society that stigmatizes mental illness so much that they are afraid of getting help. Why do I spend my time in what should be my golden years talking about mental illness stigma? I'm a father, I'm a grandfather, I'm a husband. Two very good reasons. My brother and my sister. But I also talk about it for the 22 war veterans who commit suicide every day from untreated post-traumatic stress disorder. 
I also speak for the one person in this country, usually between ages 15 and 25, who commits suicide every 17 minutes. I also speak for the person someplace in this world who makes their final exit every 40 seconds. We have a pressing need. It's not a laughing matter. Every time we see something on television about uh, some lunatic shooting up a school and killing kids, or always, it's always blamed on mental illness, you know. That just accentuates the, the negative and the stigma attached. And I sit, and I sit back and I, and, I, and I wonder, do these people know what they're talking about? Do they know that perhaps had that person gotten treatment a year earlier, that this would not have happened? Do they know that had they gotten treatment because there was no stigma attached to what they were doing, that these lives of these little boys and little girls could be saved? We are all guilty. Every person who has told a funny, that what they thought was a funny joke about the loonies in the state hospital, they're guilty. In the spirit of Nazi concentration camp survivor Elie Weissel and his speech to the accepting the Nobel Peace Prize, I swore never to be silent whenever and wherever a human being endures pain, suffering, and humiliation. We have to take sides. Neutrality only aids the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor and never the tormentor. Stigma produces all of these myths about mental illness. Good heavens. One of the myths is that, oh, that's uh, something they can just snap out of. It's not anything. Well, the fact is that mental illness is genetic, it is uh, social, it is environmental, there are a number of causes that contribute to mental illness. It's not a personality flaw. Another factor, another myth that comes up often is that, oh, once they're mentally ill, they're always mentally ill. The fact is that when people do get treatment, they can live healthy, happy, productive lives once they get past the stigma of mental illness. And of course the big one I just mentioned, that the mentally ill are violent. Mentally ill are no more violent than the rest of the population. In fact, they're more likely to be victims of violence, or self-harm, or, or other people getting them. I'm, we had an incident in Southern California two years ago where cops beat up a schizophrenic man who was in an episode. He was in an episode. They beat him up because they didn't know anything about schizophrenia or mental illness. We also have a situation in Southern California where the largest mental institution in the United States is the L.A. County Jail. It costs $60,000 a year to house and feed and provide medical care for these men and women in jail, compared to $27,000 a year for care in a facility outside of prison. Who's crazy? And Leo or the voters? I'd like to see more emphasis placed on getting good legislation through to help deal with the stigma and getting people help there. I'm going to leave you with a couple of lines from a poem that has meant a lot to me. It's why a, a 
country lawyer named Eric Erman. It's called desiderata. That's a Latin word for desired things. You are a child of the universe. No less than the trees and the stars, you have a right to be here. And whether you know it or not, the universe is unfolding just as it should. In the language of the hand, hello and uh, goodbye are the same. Dora Pyle began the talk. And I end my talk. Thank you. We have set up microphones because. How would you encourage like a friend or a family member? Um, how would you tell them that they have like a mental illness and encourage them to get an examination? Exactly. And that's a good question. How do you encourage a friend or a family member? You think they have a mental illness and help them to get help or encourage them to get help. Sometimes all you have to say is sit down and listen. That's usually the key, is listening. What's going on? What's happening? And maybe they will begin talking about the depression. They'll begin talking about, uh, if they're seriously, uh, have, have uh, 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 another illness, which in schizophrenia, in which they will see people or hear noises, you know, that's usually a good clue that they're gonna need some help. And then encourage them to get help because you know somebody or you read about somebody who has gotten help and their lives have returned to normal, but just encourage them to do that. But the main thing is listening. Can you imagine how many people have jumped out of windows in the Golden Gate Bridge, in front of trains, when all they needed to do was talk to somebody who would really listen? That's what, yes? Austin. Um, Austin? Austin, yeah. And um, my question is similar. Um, I have a friend, a really good friend, who is uh, diagnosed with uh, bipolar and uh, uh, depression. And I was wondering what words of encouragement would you give to those who are going through that? Of going through the bipolar aspect of it? Uh, yes. Uh, the words of encouragement I would give is the same words that I get from my therapist every week is that you can live an abundant life but you have to take some control over your life and that is regular sleep hygiene seven to eight hours those of us who are manic especially high uh, bipolar two uh hypermanic uh we we go without sleep i got along with two hours a night for a long time because i had so my hands in so many activities self-care is the key there good sleep patterns eating, exercise. Those are the three things that I found that stabilized me the most. And of course, uh, medication compliance. Many people who have a mental illness start feeling better, then they stop taking their meds. And that's the worst thing that can happen. Don't stop taking the medication. You're gonna be on that for the rest of your life. You'll have to change it every once in a while under psychiatric care, but don't change it. I don't, okay, thank you. Do I have somebody over here that I'm missing? Yes. Yeah, this is um, uh, this is Harish. Uh, first off, Mr. Roberts, thank you so much for coming and talking. Um, absolutely very powerful speech. Thank you. Um, I had a quick question of um, kind of after you started kind of diverting uh, kind of your um, messages and um, kind of feelings toward the issue of mental illness stigma into public speech in speeches like this, yes. how do you think that has affected your life? Talking about it publicly, I mean, very much so. Uh, let me tell you. Let me give you a quick history of public speaking and me. This will tell you how old I am. Okay, I'm 64. By the way, if you haven't figured that one out, uh, in 1963, a year before my mother passed away, 
I had gone, it was, I was out of school that summer, it was a summer day, I was out of school, I went to get a uh, Pepsi Cola and some candy, moon pie, I think it was, to come home to watch the Three Stooges. And that afternoon, the Three Stooges were preempted by something called the March on Washington, led by the Dr. Martin Luther King, who gave the most important speech in history. It lasted 17 and a half minutes. It's the I have a dream speech. And when I saw that, I said, that's what I want to be. I want to be a public speaker, but I don't know what I'm going to talk about. Yeah, but I want it. I want to be able to galvanize people in some way with, with the power of the word. So that started that process. Uh, the following year, JFK was assassinated, so that reemphasized that. But as the years went by, uh, I was always a public speaker as well as an actor, so that wasn't anything particularly new. But the message that I give today. I think was galvanized by my brother's suicide, even though that was a year before I was diagnosed. But when I found out and realized what had happened to him and why that happened, uh, I, I told myself never again, never, never again, for any family to go through that. That may be unrealistic, but it is my goal. And being able to talk about it and write about it re-emphasizes, at least for me, that I am getting better. Bipolar is not something that uh, you, you, you get well from. You don't, it's not cured. You treat it, but it's never going to be cured. There is uh, promising genetic research now for better medications, but there is no cure for it. I take medications till the day I die. But I am responsible for making my, my life a little, a little better. Uh, I'd like to say something I for actually forgot to mention uh, in my talk. Uh, I told you about being a young preacher. When I began to realize about how I could make myself feel better, I, I was recalling a verse that I used to quote when I, when I was a preacher. And the verse was found in the Gospel of John. Jesus said, and the thief comes in the night to kill and to steal. But I've come to, so that you might have life and have it more abundantly. I take that now as a metaphor for my illness. Bipolar or mental illness is that thief to steal my joy and to kill me physically and emotionally. But then I have that choice of living the abundant life. If I do the things I need to do, Take care of myself, number one. Share my story with others. That's really important. Not everybody can do that or wants to do that. I, I wrote my story, uh, just a quick summary for the National Association on Mental Illness, and they published it in September. And a lot of people responded to that. I, I was surprised. But uh, any, any opportunity I get, I try to share my story. And this is just absolutely wonderful opportunity that I've been given because of who my audience is. There may be a future Nobel Prize laureate out there among you who has discovered a cure for Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease or bipolar disorder or any other mental illness. That's what really excites me. That was a long answer to your question. It was a good question. So. <laughs> Hi. Yes. Um, my name is Sana. My question is, how would your life have been different had you been diagnosed with bipolar disorder at our age, at the age of 18? Oh, that's a wonderful question. How would my life have been different had, had I been diagnosed when I was your age? Well, first of all, the statistics are that diagnosis comes usually seven years after the first symptoms occur. So it would have been around 27. Uh, but uh, I think I could have been treated early for the depression. Uh, the problem is with bipolar is that if you give the wrong antidepressant, it will send you to the moon. That's how I wound up in Hollywood, uh, because they gave me Prozac. And that's the worst medication you can give to somebody who's bipolar. But my life would have been different had, had I recognized I have a mental illness. 
and it can be treated, and it's nothing to be sh ashamed of. My life would have been different this way. I think that my marriage would have continued. My relationship with my son and daughter would have been uninterrupted. My career, whether it was broadcast journalism, the ministry, or uh, uh, higher education, would have been uninterrupted. Uh, that's how my life would have been different. No, uh, not disparaging my lovely wife. <laughs> Not saying, okay, I'd still be married to Glenda. No, but I, it would be that it, it, it would just stop the pain that I cause with my behavior. So, yeah. Thank you.